the person you see on your screen is C. Jessica Metcalf. We, none of us know what the C mm -hmm. stands for, but she's known as, as, as Jess or Jessica. So thank you, uh, uh, Jess, from a professor at Princeton. Uh, the assignment I've given our speakers is they're going to introduce themselves in, in the one sentence that you should know is important about them for their talk. And let's just take it away. Jessica, thanks so much for, for joining us. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, just like the workshops, uh, I was mentored early by Tulja, um, thinking more evolutionary demography, but moved into thinking about infectious disease dynamics. So I have sort of both those sides. And I'm going to walk through some of the applications um, in my world, but starting at the sort of basics, which is this is the model, this schematic describes the model that is very much the workhorse of infectious disease biology, the SIR model. Individuals start susceptible, they become infected at a rate that's governed by the number of infected individuals around them, and then they recover. And from this, you can get just about, you know, some of the really critical behaviors that we believe to, you know, govern in the dynamics of infectious diseases, such as the ways in which declines in susceptibles will eventually reduce transmission to the point where not everybody in the world ends up being infected. So you end up with a fraction of individuals indirectly protected, which links, of course, to herd immunity. So, so much for infectious disease dynamics, the concepts are exactly the same as everything you do when you build a demographic model. You're essentially structuring your population and keeping track of flows between them. But these flows are not demographic. Yet, of course, demography really matters when thinking about infectious diseases. Uh, in particular, of course, infectious diseases kill people. Smallpox, as taking an example, is estimated to kill as many as 20% of the individuals who are infected. Um, but there's another sort of more subtle way in which demography affects infectious disease biology, which I think is really interesting and important. And that's because this model that I've showed, first of all, was closed. In actual fact, we believe that the susceptible individuals will be replenished by births, either directly or following an interlude of maternal immunity. Um, and this means that essentially demography by a births is pouring uh, fuel on the fire in some sense, you know, new individuals who are born into population are susceptible, and this can increase the magnitude of uh, spread of the disease. It, can, it has an effect by increased birth rates, decrease the average age of infection, they shift the critical threshold for vaccination, they do all these really interesting things. So the feedbacks are acute and important, even before you start thinking about the fact that, of course, different age classes have different properties, um, this is something that Audrey talked about. Um, Audrey mentioned that uh, contact patterns are really critical to how transmission works out. And there's been a lot of work doing this, some of which was driven by Audrey, in fact. And essentially to grapple with that, you just need to start with the same framework and blow it up to include, in, include your number of classes. And a lot of work I did when I first moved into thinking about infectious disease dynamics was thinking in particular about rubella dynamics and trying to estimate what the critical threshold for vaccination might be in order to ensure that you weren't actually driving an increase in the average age of infection that was sufficient to cause most cases to occur in women of childbearing age. And this is work that's been very much read, led recently by uh, my colleague, Amy Winter. So that's the kind of big picture of how you might think of formal demography in applied infectious disease dynamics. Of course, we're all in a different world right now. Nobody doesn't think about infectious diseases anymore. Um, and uh, I found myself again and again at the start of 2020 explaining what R0 was. And from the angle of infectious disease biologists, it comes from a slightly different place, right? We think of it as the number of new infections per infected individual in a completely susceptible population. And you combine it with the serial interval, so that's the average time separating one infected individual from the next to get at the speed of spread. So essentially what happened is that somewhere in late 2019, there was an initial case and if you were to assume that this R0 was around two and that serial interval was around a week, what happens is that the number of cases doubles every week, right? Uh, so it's quite straightforward. It means that you can read out the number of cases and pull out what you believe R0 to be, especially if you have other information on what the serial interval is, which people did by contact tracing and other processes. And it's really an important quantity. It defines the threshold required for eliminating vaccinations, et cetera. It's always a little puzzling if you come to this as a demographer, because of course we know that there's two different ways to measure population growth. This is one of them, but another one is the exponential growth rate, or how fast an epidemic grows at the population level. Um, and this sort of combines both those aspects, the R0 and the serial interval together. This became really important and interesting uh, 
at the end of 2020 when novel variants started emerging. So this is a picture from a paper in Science in early 2021, which shows um, the VOC, which was then called this incredible thing and is now called B1.1.7, the pink area, just screaming up in the proportions and their relative abundance in different parts of the UK. And of course, it's incredibly important to try and figure out what's going on with this new variant. And so what the authors of this paper did, and they did it on an incredibly short timeline and through extraordinary amounts of work, is they fitted different models to the proportion of the S gene target failure, which is how we, you know, which was a sort of, this particular variant essentially barcoded itself, which is very handy. So it came screaming up at different levels and they fit different models, which included it being more transmissible than the ancestral case, having an increased duration of infectiousness, having more immune escape, increased susceptibility in children, shorter generation time. And the black is the data, the purple is the model. You can see that this model is terrible. This model is also terrible, but the other three look pretty good. And this matters because if we understand mechanism, we can better control spread. Um, so it seems like the mechanism could be these three pieces. Um, and I don't wish to quibble with this work, which was fantastic and wonderful, but it's always good to think deeply about what's going on under the hood. And one of the things that was going on under the hood is the assumptions that they made about how R0 and that generation interval actually work. And to see this, we can step back and take the workhorse of demography, the yellow lot per equation, um, which tells us that if we think of demography as a recursion, births now must be the result of individuals being born in the past. And since we know that the, the population must be growing exponentially with a stable age distribution, we can write out something that looks like this. So if you're familiar with yellow lot curve, what I'm saying here is that that, that KT, K tau, the infection kernel is sort of equivalent to the LXMX, so the survivorship times reproduction at every age. But now we're thinking in terms of infection, tau time units ago. Okay, so same basic principle. And the handy thing here is we can also think of that infection kernel as being R, our reproductive number. So not R naught, because now we're in a population that's changing, but R times that intrinsic generation interval. So times that distribution over time, which means we can put those two things together and we can get a Euler lot for equation that includes R on one side and the exponential growth rate on the other. So now we have a way of relating the two. And we know that variants might actually affect both R, but also, so big R, but also little r. Um, and uh, if you make an assumption about the distribution of the generation interval, so say, for example, you assume it's gamma distributed, you end up with an expression that looks like this, which gives you a way of framing how the change in big R, which you can think of as a change in the strength of transmission, relates to the change in little r, which you think of, can think of as a change in the speed of transmission. Okay. And it tells you very clearly that this really depends on assumptions about the underlying generation interval distributions. So uh, for, if you write this out, if I look at R wild type against the R of the variance, you can just sort of, you know, put little uh, subscripts to define the both or the relative strength will be equal to this, whereas the relative speed might be equal to that. You can relate the two, very simple algebra. You come up with this quite funky relationship describing the difference in that transmission per unit time versus that speed. Um, and the point here is that when they fitted these models, there was sort of two interesting issues, one of which is that every model they fitted used a different assumption about the change. They never fitted the models that in included all the different changes together, right? No model included increased transmissibility and increased duration of infectiousness. Um, but they also assumed that the kappa was small. So they made an assumption about what that gamma distribution looked like, which resulted in a relatively simple relationship between rho and delta, between the relative strength and the relative speed. Um, which, again, I think this is a fantastic starting point, but it would result if there was any distribution, and we believe that there is quite a, you know, a, a considerable dist distribution in the way the infectious periods shake out for this pathogen, then you end up with biases in what you're estimating the changes. And so when people throw around numbers, like this variant is 20% more transmissible than another, it hinges on these sorts of models, which require some sort of deep thinking about how transmission works. So just to, to wrap up, um, on the formal demography infectious diseases front, they affect each other. That's the really interesting thing, right? Demography, births will infect the spread of transmission, whereas at the same time, infection changes mortality, as we've seen in talks previously today. Um, that capturing the details of the transmission across stage and age can really matter. That unpicking growth rates actually needs very careful application of fundamental principles from demography. And for all of this, we need models that sort of combine the two. And I just want to shout out to Daniel Park at Princeton, a brilliant graduate student, who did, who drove a lot of the work I talked about on the variants and is just incredibly clever. And Amy Winter, who will be starting soon at UGA and who um, has done a lot of the applied work, has been leading it on rubella vaccination using structured population models 
advising um, Global Alliance of Vaccine Groups, and I think we'll be hiring postdocs soon. So if anybody's interested um, in working with someone spectacular, then I would recommend Amy. Um, and there are some links and references, and that's all I have. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, I think I forgot to say what the general purpose of the session was, and I, I, I forgot to hassle you for telling us your one sentence. So we'll, we'll do that before we go on to Tulja. The general theme of the session is uh, how uh, do you use formal demography in your own discipline, since most people are demographers slash something else. So maybe that can be the segue to you, Jessica. What is your discipline um, that you're using demography in? Well, I don't know, Josh. I mean, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm somewhere between uh, infectious disease biology. I'm a joint appointment between the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the School of Public and International Affairs. So I tend to use it in modeling infectious disease dynamics. Does that work? Jamie. Great. So, um, great. And we have our third speaker. Welcome, Jamie. Continue. So actually, uh, Jamie, we were originally thinking of um, having you go second. Would you like a little break and put the pressure on Tolcha, or would you like to go right now? If you have uh, slides, maybe we'll do you, because Tolcha's slideless. Yeah, I've got slides, so okay. I can, I'm, I'm happy to go. Okay. I just, so I, I would honestly, encourage. Josh, I thought it was at one. It was no problem. At one. No problem. You happen to have the disadvantage of being in the same time zone and therefore not like waking up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, I have the time wrong. Because uh, so, you're in our, you're, you're a couple miles away. Let's just uh, so please please type your questions for Jessica in the chat now before or write them down on a piece of paper or something so that we make sure to address questions from Jessica's talk. And um, Jamie, the way we're doing this is uh, you're going as I just said uh, to Jessica that the theme is how is formal demography used in your discipline. So you can tell us maybe what your discipline is, or you could continue the tradition, which is say what discipline I do everything, uh, or I, I'm, I'm caught I between you, like Jessica did. You, you, your guess is as good as mine as to what my discipline is. Uh, what, what's, what's your PhD in and what's your departmental affiliation? Let's start right. that way. Okay, well, that gets interesting. I mean, my PhD is in anthropology, but I'm in earth system science. Great. And um, you started, I guess, in anthropology at, at at, at, at Stanford well, Independent. I started kind of your in own anthropological place. sciences, that's and then good. that department went away, and then I got into anthropology, which turns out to be uh, a literature criticism department only without texts. And then I got out, and and I'm in um, I'm in uh, Earth System Science, sort of doing human dimensions Great. of global change, and that includes okay, infectious so, disease ecology. I'm going to mute, and I'll let you do your thing. All right. Great, thanks. Cool. Okay, so I hopefully I've got a few things here uh, that will be of interest. You can see my slides. We this is a, a term that probably great. most people have not heard before or have have maybe avoided uh, this idea of herd immunity, and I'm afraid that. We've developed a bit of an obsession with herd immunity. And in fact, many of my colleagues here at Stanford have developed an unhealthy obsession with herd immunity. And I think this obsession reveals a, a, an epidemic that, that's been going along with the COVID epidemic of, of credulity and confirmation bias. And I actually think that uh, formal demography can help. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up a couple um, sort of key ideas in formal demography and show how they apply to thinking about the population processes of an infectious disease and how we get it under control. The first point is that heterogeneity will not save us. I think many people seem to hold this idea that, and, and I'll show you what, what this means specifically in a minute, but you know, we know that heterogeneity has profound impacts on epidemics. Tolja can tell us all about how variability affects population dynamics better than I can, but one regular consequence of heterogeneity in epidemics is that the, the epidemics end up being smaller. Their growth rate ends up, their effective growth rate ends up being lower. Their final size ends up being uh, smaller than the well-mixed unstructured model that we use at, at, as a first pass. Um, and I think a lot of people have held out hope that maybe this heterogeneity will, will get us out of the mess we've created. Uh, and it's not going to. And I, I hope to use uh, some tools from formal demography, some concepts from formal demography to, to show why that's the case. So this is the Great Barrington Troika. For those of you who don't know, this is a, a group who released um, 
a statement advocating for what they call the herd immunity approach, right? They want, they want social distancing, lockdowns, mask wearing uh, to, to be eliminated, or they've, they've wanted this for a while and they want natural immunity to, they want the population to get infected and for sort of so-called natural immunity to take over and lead to a situation in which we are, are in the condition of herd immunity. So what is herd immunity? It's, it's certainly a word that quasi experts on Twitter and the Wall Street Journal like to bandy about, but I'm gonna suggest that we ask noted epidemiologist Erin Mears to help us understand it. Here she is from the 2011 movie Contagion and she's gonna tell us, right, that, that what fraction of the population do we need to vaccinate or otherwise remove from a susceptible state through natural infection, for example, assuming that, that, that um, there's, there's uh, immunity follows from infection. What fraction do we have to remove from an infectious state to prevent an, a, an outbreak, okay? And there's a very straightforward way of calculating this. If we let R be the reproduction number, um, it's a, so it's a general reproduction number, it's not the basic reproduction number of an immunized population, then uh, you know, R, R is less than or, or equal to R naught times the, the P is the fraction that we vaccinate. So one minus P is the fraction who will remain susceptible at the outset of an epidemic. And we want to solve for P in such a way that, that our R is going to be less than one. And that's a pretty trivial little bit of algebra. And this is the classic result, right, from, from mathematical epidemiology that, that the critical vaccination threshold in a well-mixed unstructured population is one minus one over R naught. So if we take as a sort of middling estimate for R naught for, for COVID as a, about 2.5, this means we have to vaccinate approximately 60% of the population. Um, and this means, you know, for some of the classic childhood diseases, measles with an R naught that's nearly 20, it means, right, one minus one over 20, right, is, is 0.95. We, we basically have to vaccinate successfully the entire population. Um, but, you know, the world is not well mixed, but also really important, there's, a, there's been this obsession with, um, with herd immunity and that somehow maybe when we achieve herd immunity, magically the, the pandemic goes away. We need to be really careful not to confuse this with the final size of the epidemic. The final size will typically be much bigger than the herd immunity threshold. And the difference between the two is what's known as epidemic overshoot. This is a phenomenon that's, that's almost perfectly analogous to Kiefit's momentum um, when you have fertility change, okay? So for the, take your SIR model, you know, I've, I've, I'm fast and loose with the details here. Divide your, your, your equation for infections, your DIDT, uh, by your, your equation for the change in, in, in susceptible individuals, integrate, do a little algebra, and you get this, this sort of classic result. So we want, uh, if we think about this geometrically, we want a case where a logarithmic curve in O and S infinity is the fraction who are susceptible at the end of the pandemic or the end of the epidemic. So we want uh, geometrically where a, 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 a logarithmic curve, this is of course a natural logarithm, is equal to a line that's rooted at minus, uh, minus R naught and has a slope of R naught, right? So we have something that looks like this. And one of the things that we can see is this is uh, for an R naught of three, two and a half, two, and this is for a, a subcritical epidemic where, the, where R naught is, is, less than, is less than one. You can see that it doesn't touch the line here any, anywhere other than at one. So it means that nobody uh, asymptotically is, is infected at the end of an epidemic when R naught is less than the critical value. But here for two and a half, you know, it hits somewhere somewhere in here, um, somewhere in here. And we can see, uh, you know, you can plot this for different values of R naught, what the final size will be. And for R naught of, of two and a half, our, our final size is about 90% of the population. All right, so this, this epidemic overshoot is, is real. Um, and in fact, as Carl Bergstrom has pointed out, oh, and, and just if we think about that for a second, you know, I, I got, a, a, people gave me a hard time early on when I said, I think there could easily be a million deaths in the United States from COVID. Um, they're like, oh my God, you're so pessimistic. I mean, the deal is if the final size is 90% of the population, we've got 330 million people approximately, we've got essentially 300 million infections if we don't do anything and assuming that the US is well mixed and 
uh, you know, it isn't, but these are surprisingly robust calculations. If we imagine a, a one half percent infection mortality ratio, then that's one and a half million deaths. So actually, you know, it seems like a million isn't that uh, out of the blue, right? And people saying that they're going to be 10,000 deaths, people saying that they're going to be, you know, less than 100,000 deaths, um, weren't thinking about the theory the, uh, very hard. Like, this is a blunt tool for sure. Right, but it gives you order of magnitude type estimates, and and they're of the case, right? It's it's like it's like demographic projection. It's like we're we're projecting a population with a, a cohort component model, right? It's assuming nothing changes, and uh, obviously things change, but this gives us our our order of magnitude of what we need to be worried about, right? Carl Bergstrom, in a really helpful tweet, suggested you know pointed out that the that the peak of incidents, the red here is the, is the dynamics of the, the infectious uh, um, element of the, of the segment of the population. It actually peaks when we hit the, um, the critical vaccination threshold or the herd immunity threshold. So we've got lots of momentum to carry us through from 60% to 90%. We can think of the 60% as almost like an invasion criterion. If 60% of the susceptibles are removed from the population, a novel disease can't get started, right? But one that's in the throes of, a, of transmission can certainly go, and it's gonna go for a long while until it hits a, the, the final size. All right, um, there has been a great deal of interest in suggesting, as we, as we observe, right, that, that the incidence tends to peak and then start to, starts to decline in these very highly hip areas, these high incidence areas like, like Wuhan initially, like New York City last spring, like Bergamo in, in the spring as well, that 20% that seems to be uh, a, a point at which there's, there's a, a, a decay in incidence. And there, a lot of people have jumped on that. Remember, there's an epidemic of credulity out here um, that's saying, oh, actually, the herd immunity threshold is much lower than what the epidemiologists say, 60 70%, right? It's actually probably closer to 20%. And you know there are lots of lots of, of blowhards on Twitter saying this, and lots of people writing, um, lots of maybe Stanford faculty writing uh, editorials in the Wall Street Journal saying this. But also some some quite serious people have have suggested this as well. And you know here's a, a sampling of, of people I respect. You know serious researchers, Gabriella Gomes from from Strathclyde University, Tom Britton, you know who's a a fantastic probabilist and, and, and infectious disease modeler and, and Frank Ball, who's one of the, you know, the, the, the grandparents of, of uh, stochastic uh, epidemic models. So these, these people have all suggested that maybe the um, herd immunity threshold based on the heterogeneity is much lower than it is. I think that they're wrong. Um, and but I'll, let me just very quickly. Hopefully, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm getting close to being done here. Um, Perfect. Okay, thanks, Josh. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a, a hint of of where their ideas come from, uh, and why why we shouldn't uh, be uh, credulous of them. Okay, so here I have I've drawn a network. I've actually drawn it from. This is a compound distribution. It's a it's a, a gamma Poisson compound distribution, which has a marginal distribution of negative binomial. And I've drawn the, um, the degree that, so the, the number of, the, the, the number of uh, ties that are incident to a vertex. Uh, I've, I've drawn that from this distribution, looks something like this. We've got a fair amount of heterogeneity in, in contact. We can see that there's one extremely, um, extremely active person who has a degree of 33. There are a number who have degrees on the order of 10 as well. And a reasonable scenario that we can imagine is that if disease is traversing a network that looks something like this, then your probability of acquiring infection is probably somehow proportional to your degree. And if you are a star who looks like this, who has a, a lot of of connections, you're likely to get infected, and you're likely to get infected early on in the epidemic. Okay, and if we take out the five most active nodes, just five, right, in this in this this uh, toy network of of a hundred nodes, 
we, we're left with something that looks like this. And we have these big, these big gaps in here. We get, we start to throw off uh, smaller components, right? And and uh, as we as the epidemic proceeds, right, we get we get an opening up more and more. We get more component disconnected components. We get bigger holes. And this is an idea that we we refer to as network frailty, right? This idea that 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 the the vertices in your graph that that tie it together that that lead to uh, the coherence, the cohesion of the graph are the are likely the first to go in an epidemic. They have, the, and so there's a frailty process here. It opens up the network, and what we what you get is a much smaller final size than you'd expect based on the well mixed model, because this is not a well mixed model, right? We, this is a there are discrete contacts in this that we've specified. So that's the broad idea behind why heterogeneity leads to smaller final sizes, leads to lower um, uh, uh, herd immunity thresholds. And the, the thing is that, that the classic cases of network frailty occur with sexually transmitted diseases, where we know that the degree distributions are highly skewed. They're actually often much more skewed than this negative binomial distribution. You can see that negative binomials come up because Just was talking about them as well. Right, negative binomials come up a lot in, in disease modeling because we get this over dispersion of things. Um, it would be great to have better theory to explain why that is. Um, but um, so the question is for respiratory disease, what does the distribution of, of degree look like for a contact network? And it turns out that Marcel Soate and I actually measured that about a decade ago. Um, using uh, these wireless sensor network moats that we hung around a, 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 about a thousand kids um, necks in a, in a big school here in the Bay Area. And what we get is this is a strength, so it's a weighted degree distribution. Um, it's weighted by time. And what we get is a, um, is a, a, a degree density, you know, a strength density that uh, this is a, just a single Gaussian, the purple, and this pink here is a, a two component Gaussian mixture. It's the best fitting model of a bunch that we fit. Um, and the reality is that there simply isn't that much heterogeneity in face-to-face -face within two meter contact. All right now, aerosol transmission makes this more complicated, absolutely. Um, so we are going to get some, some, some longer tails as a result of that, but I, I just don't think that, uh, and this is, this is uh, effectively a prediction. I don't think that we have enough heterogeneity in our networks that we're going to get substantial frailty effects. Okay, let me what, try to bring you to a conclusion, Jamie. We'll get to right. talk more among each other. Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, herd immunity, yeah, it's not, it's not happening. Uh, we are seeing population cycling. I'll, just give me 30 seconds. Uh, paper by Ronan Arthur shows that, uh, uh, Fear-related behavior changes can drive uh, pretty steady cycling like this. We see a lot of uh, of interactions, uh, like like group-level interactions between uh, American groups. And one of the the key takeaway from that point that I didn't have time to get into is that that can actually raise this type of heterogeneity. The structured homophilous interactions can actually raise the herd immunity threshold and the final size of an epidemic and they can prolong epidemics there. So it's bad news, um, but hopefully I've, I've helped uh, link some formal demography concepts like frailty, like he fits momentum, uh, homophily into uh, thinking about infectious disease and some of the policy questions that we're faced with right now. Super, thanks so much, Jamie. Um, and now we are ready for our uh, third panelist, uh, Sripad Tuljapurkar, uh, who uh, I'll, 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 maybe I'll do the same question. Uh, is, are, are, you a, are you a qualifying panelist for this panel? Are you a person who uses demo, demography outside of demography? Uh, yeah, I think so. I use it outside and inside. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll just say a little bit about uh, um, what I've sent, uh, you know, Jess and, and uh, Jamie had talked uh, quite a bit about R naught and some of the other uh, basics of modeling epidemiology. Um, 
one of the things that is interesting about this is that when you start thinking about structure, formal demography is really useful. Jamie talked about some applications of this uh, where he was thinking about structure in terms of group identity, contact patterns, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, but in formal demography, uh, the old line is that you break everything down by age and sex. And so the question is, what does age structure and population dynamics um, contribute to uh, thinking about epidemics or control of diseases? And uh, I sent um, two papers, which I think I have been posted, and I just want to talk very briefly about uh, the two of them. Uh, one, uh, incidentally, my co-author on both papers, uh, the person who actually was, I think, at least uh, the driving force behind all this was also at Princeton uh, many years ago <clears throat> at the Office of Population Research. And uh, <clears throat> the question we were thinking about was that it's very common to immunize children. And uh, so now we have this thing in the United States where you have a kid and they have to have a certain number of shots. And then when they go to, to school at age six, they, they have to prove that they have those shots. So that's the way it goes. Um, in many developing countries, we don't actually know what the ages are. So you've got kids and they could be four, they could be six, they could be eight. And the question is, when you are uncertain uh, about this and when you don't have a, a continued um, process of record keeping on each individual, uh, the way you deliver immunizations very often is that you simply send out a truck and um, it gets parked in you know, some village or town. And then you know, who do you immunize? So the question is, do you ask the children who walk by how old they are? And do you rely on the answer? Do you ask their parents? What do you do? So this is one of the issues that we were thinking about. And it's an actual practical problem in many countries. Um, and uh, it turns out that formal demography helps you analyze uh, this kind of thing. And you will see a discussion of that in one of the papers I sent out. Um, the second thing which we can talk about is density effects. You know, I, I had a, an email from a friend of mine um, who said that uh, they expected a lot more um, effects of COVID-19 in places like India um, or other places because there were, quote, hordes of people, uh, unquote, in these places. And it is true that the population sizes in say um, Kenya or India or um, places like that are quite high. Um, but in fact, the density is really what matters. Um, and density varies a lot from urban settings to rural settings, uh, even in those countries. Um, so this paper that I, the other second paper that I, I sent along is an attempt to think about the effects of density and how they um, contribute at the local level to the passage of infections from infected to susceptible or infectious to susceptible individuals. Um, and so there is a big difference between local densities and, and densities in the large, so to speak. And um, when you start thinking about these sources of heterogeneity, you can often do it using methods from formal demography. Um, the second general point I want to make uh, relates to uh, what is on everybody's mind, certainly on many of the speakers here, which is COVID-19. And one of the things you uh, can do is think about the effects of age structure on COVID-19. And age structure really does matter. If you look at countries where <clears throat> the population is much younger than in countries where the population is much older, then you immediately see that there's got to be an, an impact of the age structure of the population. And um, 
I would urge you to look at, um, I think uh, Wen Yun Zuo and I wrote a blog about this, which uh, I think Josh knows where it is, but it's on- yeah, I'll post it in chat, I'll post it in chat. Okay, it's, it's on the demography blog. And um, then there is a paper um, by a bunch of people, including Miko Merskela, um, where they talk about the use of decomposition methods to think about a, the effects of age structure um, on uh, how many people have the disease and what kinds of mortality uh, you expect. Um, and that really brings me to my last point, which I think is, is an important uh, thing that formal demography could contribute to. Um, there's been a lot of interest in the question of emerging infectious diseases. Um, and, you know, we have groups of people in this country and elsewhere who are either monitoring populations or um, trying to uh, prognosticate about, you know, which populations are going to be most affected by emerging diseases. But what we have in, in the world as a whole is a tremendous shift in the age structure of populations because you've got aging populations, you've got low fertilities, longer lives, and this is happening not just in the developing world, but or well, the developed world, but also in the rapidly emerging economies and pretty much everywhere else. If you look at TFRs around the globe, they are, I think a global TFR is pretty close to replacement. And I see no signs that it won't keep falling. Um, what that means is that regardless of what the UN may think, um, I think the, uh, in a lot of places we know that population growth rates are very small relative to history. And in a lot of other places, um, they will be so very low in the future. What does that imply in terms of the kinds of diseases and the kinds of threats that we want to think about going forward? Um, I think that um, a lot of the thinking uh, that people have had in the past about these is based on, like so much of our thinking, is based on populations that are growing and the idea that population pyramids look sort of like a pyramid and actually they don't, you know, now population structures look more sort of like that. And uh, we need to think about what's happening as we make the transition from this kind of structure to that. And we can do that with formal demography. So I'm gonna stop there um, and Thank you so much, Tolja. That was fantastic. Uh, thank you all three for wonderful talks. And I think we could just stop here because we've really got wonderful kind of uh, wedding cake type presentations from all three of you. But uh, let's try to add some extra frosting on the cake and, and probe you further. Um, I'm just going to call on people who've entered in, who've entered their name into chat and, and I'll leave you guys, the, 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 the trainees to kind of pronounce their own questions. So uh, Jacqueline, you had a question about herd immunity. Um, yeah, I think he answered it in the chat. I said, um, do you think we'll ever reach herd immunity? I was heartbroken when I read the New York Times saying no earlier in May. And then I put a link to the opinion piece in the New York Times. Uh, it looks like he wrote back and said, probably not. It's certainly endemic already. Jacqueline, I can't quite understand you. Could you maybe speak a little slower into your mic? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, here, maybe I can turn on my camera. That's fine um, now. Yeah, I was just asking if we're ever going to get herd immunity at this point. And it looked like Jamie was saying no. I'd like to hear what Jess has to say about that. I, I guess I don't understand the question. Maybe you could repeat the question, Jamie, or somebody who has better access to a mic. Well, so the question is, right, the, the idea of herd immunity is that when you, when you reach a critical threshold of, of removal of susceptible people, uh, you can't have an epidemic, but, but you don't have herd immunity in diseases that have endemic phases. And I'm afraid that we're, we're, we're going to- Don't have herd immunity in diseases that what? Have endemic uh, dynamics. Endemic, okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so, okay. Uh, you know, you, you, you have local outbreaks that, that, that die out, certainly, but, you, you know, as you run out of local fuel, but I, I think- Global disease, okay. I think that SARS Jessica? coronavirus too is with us. 
Um, so I think much of our future hinges on what secondary infections look like. I think Jamie probably agrees. If secondary infections are much milder than primary infections, or if infection after vaccination is much milder, then we won't reach herd immunity, but the coronavirus will become something like one of the common colds. So our colleague Otto Bjornstad and Rustamantia, led by Jenny Levine, wrote a lovely paper on this. Um, and I think, you know, that's the happy future. Uh, I don't think, I think Jamie and I both think that based on the, I'm just speaking for you, Jamie, based on what we know of the coronavirus, it's very unlikely that they're completely immunizing, that you, you'll be immune forever. And even if they were, with our current um, inability to vaccinate children with levels of hesitancy, the chances of chasing it down to the last case are pretty, pretty or the case, you know, below that threshold are pretty slim. Is that fair, Jamie? Did I represent us? <laughs> no, that was perfect. And, and I actually think that that's unfortunately a growing uh, reality of, uh, you know, we have to an extent saturated. We've, we've I, I mean, bringing in frailty again, right? We've, we've vaccinated the people who are really enthusiastic about being vaccinated for the most part. Um, and the, the next 40% of the US population is going to be much, much harder, right? And they're going to get increasingly difficult. So we're going to have a substantial fraction of the population who's going to remain unvaccinated stubbornly. Um, so and 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 as I said, with the with the intensity of the homophily, the, the sort of the and the outgroup aversion that we've seen, right? Like based on social characteristics, you know, I look at someone else and, and their behavior with respect with respect to the epidemic, and I'm like. Whatever I do, I'm not going to do what that person's doing. And that's a problem when that other person is doing something adaptive, right? And, and that type of homophily, this is exactly what, what Marcel and Sebastian Bonhoeffer showed in that, in that fabulous paper in 2008, that that raises the epidemic threshold, that, that raises the final size, that raises the, the herd immunity threshold. And we are in a bad place with respect to that type of clustering behavior. So what about the children? I mean, like a lot of the, the talk about unvaccinated people is with regards to like adults who are unwilling to get vaccinated. There's going to be at some point where the children will be approved to be vaccinated and we'll see another batch of them getting it all kind of at the same time. But right now we know that like they're less affected by it. They may transmit it. Is it just a matter of time before all the children get COVID? Um, so I... I think it's not important. I don't think we know, right? So it really depends on, on what the future holds. Audrey's work also reminds us that children keep being born. <laughs> so you'd have to keep pace with the vaccination for that. And it's very hard to put your eyes on that at the moment if you think at all about global health, right? I just, every vaccine that goes into an eight-year-old that's likely to have a very mild infection here is one that's not going to a healthcare worker who is on the front lines in, as it were, Madagascar. And, you know, these are very hard problems, but uh, just based on the balance of risks right now, it seems like that should be where that was focused. Okay, I have a generic question. Um, whatever you were gonna say, I was gonna ask you this question. And we had um, Jen Dowd talk to us on Tuesday. And one of her messages was, uh, demographers don't, uh, don't get intimidated into staying in your lane. You could have an influence outside of your field, and I guess I'd just like to hear from from people about staying in your lane in using uh, either formal demography or also maybe just a little bit with the pandemic in in general. Pros and cons. What what, what do you want to urge the trainees? Do what they do, do it well, or 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 uh, and and stay in their lane, or um, try to team up with people. I mean, I guess when I see this stuff, I realize you know I could probably I could probably go learn. Uh, mathematical epidemiology. I have a lot of the things, but I probably is better off continuing to do demography because there are a lot of people who already know mathematical epidemiology. I don't have anything to contribute, for example. It's super fun, though, right, Josh? <laughs> I think we should pursue the things that are fun and interesting. I think that there is a way in which, you know, that the, the uh, economists were particularly egregious, <laughs> uh, in which people started making strong pronouncements. Physicists often do this as well, but then there are people who do it brilliantly, uh, in which case, you know, you would not wish to uh, discourage people from exploring the space. I, I don't know. 
Told you, weren't you a physicist once? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think you should do whatever is interesting and that you can do well. Um, so, um, in fact, I think I think um, I was talking to Ron once, years <laughs> Ron Lee, years ago, and I said uh, I, I was excited about some something or other. And I said, you know, we ought to do this. And he said, uh, no, I don't think so, because there's no comparative advantage uh, to our doing this. And he was absolutely right. I mean, uh, and I think that's the key. Um, you want to find out, you know, can you bring something to the party that um, other people can't? And the second is what Cliff said, right, which is that working with other people is often key. If you find someone who's slightly abreast of you, but, uh, you know, those connections can be great. Yeah, so let me, let me let me push a little further. A comparative advantage of 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 someone with a lot of formal demog formal demographic thinking, training, modeling experience. Well, what is it in, in this context? What is what? You've all said different things. You've all already kind of preliminary answered that question in many ways. But what is the comparative advantage? I think was Josh's question. Ah. Yeah. Uh, of the of the formal demographer, I'm sorry, I think my connection may not be super. Well, well I'll tell you uh, one thing that I think, and this may be partially because of the company I keep. Um, I, I don't know on anyone else's screen, but I'm next to that person on the Hollywood Squares right now. Um, I think that demographers have a pretty good sense of uh, of uncertainty, and one of the things that's been really damaging, I think, about the public discourse on on the epidemic is there's a there's a, a third epidemic I've mentioned the epidemic of credulity and and um, and uh, uh, confirmation bias. A third is of of absolute certainty of things that for which there is no certainty. And and you know demographers who work with uncertainty and projections and these sorts of things have perhaps a little humility to bring to the table and say you know when we make a projection. We don't actually know, right? We can make a projection and we can tell you about the assumptions that go into it. I would love to see more of that in the public discourse over the epidemic and, and all sorts of matters of, of population, environment, science, policy. I don't know if that gets you into the Wall Street Journal though. Is that a desirable yeah, I think it's a reminder that uh, that our I think it's a reminder that our field is many things. It's not just the modeling; it's the culture of the field and the attention to these kind of questions that we all take for granted, like what's the population impact, what's the quality of the data, how do we think about uncertainty, and what a model does for us is actually that's kind of the the, the tacit knowledge that we all carry with us, and sometimes we're not even aware aware of it. Absolutely, yeah. and the data quality and, and the evaluation of data quality, I think, is, is absolutely an enormous comparative advantage that demographers can bring to, uh, to the table. Great, okay, so why don't we, uh, do we if, if, if anybody wants to make concluding words, we can, I can give them a, a chance, and otherwise we're gonna finish on time and I just thank everybody. I was a little nervous about the session because I didn't know if uh, it would all gel and if I, doing less by me ended up you guys doing more and it was really interesting to hear everybody's perspective and I thought it came out really well. Any any final words from from Jessica? A call for uh, research assistant openings, postdoc openings, you can advertise your own thing anybody can do. You've got, um, you've got 60 people here who are all, all enthusiastic. And so an eye on Amy Winter who's going to start at UGA soon. I think she'll have some interesting positions on vaccination policy and demography and uh, um, yeah, I think we might have something opening at Princeton as well coming up. Super. Told you, Jamie, should we leave it there? I mean, I'll make a plug. We, we are probably going to be uh, advertising for a postdoc to work on a problem of uh, that's quite relevant to what I've been talking about, of, about uncertainty and how uncertainty um, changes people's preferences for gathering information and what the consequences are for aggregated populations. So 
Super, super. Okay. Uh, well, thank. Let's uh, let's all be as expressive as we can. Turning off our mutes, turning on our cameras, and thank all three of the speakers for their really thoughtful presentations and taking the time to share their ideas with us. Thanks, Thanks so everybody. Much. Thank you so uh, much. With that, I declare the fourth day of our workshop uh, completed, successfully completed, and I look forward to seeing everyone uh, tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Tolja. Thanks, Jamie.